The sufferings, the hardships, the trials, the persecutions that we experience in life, they have a unique way of reminding us of our own humanity, don't they? In one way, they are masterful teachers. They have a way of teaching us that perhaps we're not as strong, we're not as formidable, we're not as tough, we're not as unbreakable as we sometimes think we are. In fact, we are very much the opposite, aren't we? The sufferings of sickness and physical pain have a way of teaching us how weak and frail our bodies are. Death, the loss of someone around us, has a way of teaching us how temporal and how transient our lives are. Persecution, opposition toward our faith has a way of teaching us how dependent and vulnerable we are. Our sufferings remind us that when it all comes down to it, we're really nothing more than weak and pitiful men and women. And yet the sufferings of life not only teach us something about ourselves, but they also teach us something about God. They teach us something of his power and his glory, especially when his power is put on display in and through our suffering. They teach us something of his care and his concern for his people, that he will never leave nor forsake them, that he will never let our sufferings ultimately overtake our faith. And they teach us not only of his temporal care for his people, but of his eternal care as well as he uses our sufferings to loosen the hold that earthly, temporal, fleeting things have on our hearts so that we might then more fully fix our eyes on the future grace and glory that God has prepared for all of those who are in him. And so in all these ways and more, we can see how suffering is a masterful teacher. And because of all that it has to teach us, and because of all that God shows himself to be in and through our suffering, we ought not to lose heart when we face trials of various kinds. We do not lose heart because we know that the surpassing power belongs to God, that somehow he will show himself strong in the midst of our human weakness. We do not lose heart because we know that the hope of the future resurrection is sure, the decay of our bodies and ultimately one day our very own death will give way to life. And we do not lose heart because we know that the eternal weight of glory that awaits us is infinitely weightier and infinitely longer than whatever earthly sufferings and trials we may experience. We will see these truths developed in our passage of scripture together this morning. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 18. Now, there's a lot of truth to unpack in this passage as I was studying, and I thought, man, you could turn a several-week sermon series uh, out of this passage, but today we'll consider it as a whole and look at some of the main truths that it has to communicate to us and how they apply. So let me read the whole passage to you now. And then I'll pray and we'll continue to look at it together. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that we can open this morning. We pray that as we open it and look to it, that you would speak to us, Lord. This is why we're here. We desire to hear from you, that we might be changed, and that we might be made to be more into the image of Jesus Christ. Pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, give me unction and power and boldness as I declare your word, that everything that proceeds from my mouth would be anointed of you, and that your word would accomplish much in our midst. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians about a year after he wrote 1 Corinthians. And he wanted to visit the Corinthian believers, but we find out in this letter that his plans changed. And so he wrote them a letter again instead from Macedonia. And he writes this letter in part as a defense of his own sufferings and to reveal God's purposes in them. And so throughout the letter, he speaks of his opponents who he sarcastically has coined the super apostles. These were men that had risen up in the Corinthian church, uh, and they, they had been disseminating false teaching, and they were opposing Paul's ministry. These super apostles essentially were saying that Paul was too weak and had far too much hardship in his life to be considered a legitimate spirit filled apostle. And so much of 2 Corinthians is written to counteract these false ideas. And the themes that we'll see in our passage today are really interwoven throughout the entire book. If you were to read the book, you'd see these themes come up again and again and again. And perhaps we'll look at some of those other places together. The main point for this morning's sermon is this. That as Christians, no matter what sufferings may come our way, no matter what challenges we may face... No matter how weak we may be shown to be at times, no matter how strongly opposed we may be because of our faith, we do not lose heart. We persevere. We plod on. We keep our hand to the plow. In faith, we continue to do what God has called us to do. Why? Well, we'll look at three reasons together. From this text, three reasons why we do not lose heart, three reasons why we persevere in and through the challenges of life. Three reasons. Here's the first number one, our perseverance in suffering is a witness to the surpassing power of God. Our perseverance in suffering is a witness to the surpassing power of God. Verse seven really provides a thesis for the next. For the rest of the passage, really, and especially the next few verses. So look with me at verse 7 again. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And so Paul begins with this very vivid, effective metaphor. He speaks about treasures in jars of clay. Now, you have to know a jar of clay is about as unimpressive of a thing as you can get. Okay, there's absolutely nothing special about a jar of clay. They're, they're like a dime a dozen. In fact, in the ancient world, they're the, very, they're the most common artifact. So you would have found them in the poorest of homes. There's nothing special about them. They would easily crack. They would easily be broken. And when they broke, you wouldn't shed a tear. You would just go and buy another one or make another one and throw the old one out. Think of them like a throwaway Tupperware container. Okay, it lasts for a little while, but then it cracks or it breaks or it discolors. And so you replace it. No problem. Okay, throw it in the garbage, get another one. No sweat off your brow. Well, in this illustration, we are the insignificant clay pots. And this metaphor that Paul uses, it's not unique to Paul. It's a metaphor that's used often in Scripture. We find uses of it in the Old Testament. Paul's borrowing language from there. 
In Psalm 31, verse 12, the psalmist says, I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. So that word vessel refers to a jar of clay, a a clay pot. The prophet in Isaiah 30 speaks to the weakness and fragility of clay pots metaphorically when he says in verse 14, and its breaking is like that of a potter's vessel that is smashed so ruthlessly that among its fragments not a shard is found with which to take fire from the hearth or to dig up water out of the cistern. So clay pots deteriorate, they break, eventually they turn to dust. There's not even shards left from dust to dust. And so as human beings, contrary to what these so-called super apostles would have been teaching, we are not very impressive creatures in and of ourselves. Okay? With age, our bodies begin to crack. Sickness can so easily befall us. And we're reminded in those times of sickness how weak we are. We get tired easily. We're, We're just not that much to boast about. And yet, this verse says that as Christians, as measly clay pots, we have this great treasure within us that's of exceeding value. What is it? What is this treasure that's found in jars of clay that Paul speaks about? Well, verse 7, of course, comes on the heels of verse 6. So I want you to look at your Bibles at verse 6 and notice that phrase at the end there. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the treasure. The knowledge of God, the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of the gospel, the knowledge that has saved us and is transforming us and is shining through us. That's the treasure. And so this contrast between a clay pot on the one hand and this treasure of Christ on the other, it's quite a remarkable contrast. Picking up on this contrast, Paul Barnett writes, Striking is the contrast between the radiant treasure of the knowledge of God in the heart and the inexpensive, breakable receptacle that bears it, an earthen pot. Such vessels are both cheap and fragile, thus having no enduring value in their own right. Only their contents give them worth. A clay pot is cheap and fragile, Essentially valueless, but its contents in this metaphor is what gives it worth. Now, I I proposed to my wife Erin 13 years ago on April 11th, sorry, April 16th, 2011, the day after her birthday. And I had planned out the entire day, a day full of activities, and my plan was that it would all culminate in this final moment at the end of the day where I would hand Erin a Kinder Egg. And so pretty much all day, we went through these activities, and I had one hand in my pocket, and I was holding on for dear life to that Kinder Egg. I was clutching it in my pocket so that it wouldn't get lost, and I wouldn't misplace it. And you might say, why? It's just a Kinder Egg. It's like 99 cents. You lose it, you go buy another one at the dollar store, no problem. Well, the night before, I had carefully opened up this Kinder Egg, I think I was watching a how-to video on YouTube or something like that. (laughs) And I replaced the stock toy that it came with, with a diamond ring. And carefully, I put the two halves back together. I resealed the wrapper around it, tried to make it look as good as new as I could. And of course, my hope was at the end of the day, I would give her the egg. She would open it. She'd be surprised by the ring. She'd find me on one knee. I'd make my appeal, and she would say yes. And though not all that day went as planned, and there are more stories I could share, we did eventually reach that crucial moment in a roundabout way, and she said yes, and as the saying goes, the rest is history. But man, I'll tell you, I remember clutching on to that egg in my pocket for dear life throughout the entire day. We went out for two meals. I don't think I took my jacket off. She probably thought I was a weirdo, like, what is wrong with this guy? But what made the Kinder Egg so valuable and so important and significant to me was, of course, not the egg, the vessel itself, but rather the contents that were found within it. The diamond ring is what gave the egg great value. In verse 7, Paul is saying that in and of ourselves, we are like weak, inexpensive clay pots. 
Okay, not much value there. But the treasure of Christ that is found within us is of great worth and great value. The question is why? Why has God designed it this way? Why has he chosen weak, unimpressive people to hide this exceedingly valuable treasure in? Well, verse 7 gives us the reason. Notice that word there, too. You might translate it, in order to. It tells us why God has made it and designed it this way. And here's the reason. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. It's to put his power on display against the backdrop of our weakness. And in so doing, his power looks all the more mighty when contrasted with our weakness. And as I said, this is a theme mentioned throughout this letter. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 30, Paul says, If I must boast, I will boast of things that show my weakness. In 12 verse 9 he writes, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then in 13 verse 4 he says, For he, speaking of Jesus, was crucified in weakness, but lives in the power of God. You want to see power on display in weakness? Look no further than the cross of Jesus, where Jesus in his humanity was crucified on the cross, where he died, and some might look at that and say weak, and yet the power of God is put on display in a way that the world had never experienced before, in that sin, death, and Satan was conquered on the cross. Power in weakness. He was crucified in weakness, but lives in the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. God's power manifested in our weakness. And so Paul then, he's not unashamed, unash- sorry, he is unashamed of his weakness. He's not ashamed of it. In fact, he's learned to boast in it, to glory in it. Because it's what God uses to bring great glory to himself. As men and women, we are, we are weak. We are powerless. We're fragile clay pots. And it seems that we're most aware of that reality during times of suffering. Which is why when we persevere through those times, when we don't lose heart, when we press on in our devotion to Christ, God has brought that much more glory And so it's no surprise then that in verses 8 to 9, after verse 7, he now illustrates this principle of power in weakness using instances of suffering. And these two verses are really autobiographical for Paul. There's no doubt that as he writes these verses, he has specific examples and memories in his mind as he speaks of these sufferings. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I I find that rhetoric very powerful. To be afflicted means to be hard-pressed, to be squeezed, to be pressured. To be perplexed means to be cornered or dazed. To be persecuted means to be opposed or hounded or pursued. And to be struck down means to be put in a state of melancholy or depression. And as I said, this is no doubt autobiographical for Paul. He had specific instances in his mind. You can read through many of his sufferings in the book of Acts. And so in one sense, the sufferings in which he's speaking of, they're unique to his calling and ministry. But surely many of us, as we read these words, we can identify on some level with the feelings and the emotions contained in these words. On some level, we know what he means. We've been afflicted at times. We know what it means to be perplexed, to be at a loss. We've been persecuted. We've been opposed for our faith. Sometimes we've been struck down. Sometimes God brings us right to the brink. He brings us right to the edge. But this text reminds us that he never lets go. He never lets us fall over. He never lets us be destroyed. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave or forsake us. I came across a helpful translation of these two verses that I think capture 
how moving they are quite well and capture what Paul is communicating. It was written by a man named Merrill Tenney, who was one of the Greek scholars on the translation team for the NASB, the original version of the NASB Bible. And so here's his personal translation of these verses. He says, we are in every way squeezed, but not squashed, bewildered, but not befuddled, pursued, but not abandoned. And I like this one, knocked down, but not knocked out. Maybe you resonate with that. We get knocked down at times, but we will never be knocked out. Why? Why are we never squashed or befuddled or abandoned or knocked out? It's only because of the surpassing power of God. He watches over us. His sovereign power enables us to persevere in the midst of great adversity. And so Christian, maybe you find yourself in the midst of a dark and difficult trial right now, whatever it may be. Maybe you resonate with some of Paul's words here in verses 8 and 9. You understand what it means to suffer like this because you're going through it perhaps even right now. And so you're in a place where you're keenly aware of your own weakness and frailty. You don't need to be reminded of that. Well, if that's you in the midst of whatever it is you're going through, we could list a whole host of different examples of sufferings. I want you to look down at your Bible and notice those two words in verses 8 and 9 that show up again and again. But not. But not. Afflicted, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. How much comfort we find in those two words. Matthew Henry, picking up on this, said, Whatever condition the children of man may be in in this world, they have a but not to comfort themselves with. Their case sometimes is bad, yeah, very bad, but not so bad as it might be. And so we see this concept of treasure in jars of clay illustrated in these verses, in verses 8 and 9. Everything before the but not In each of those four couplets, you can categorize as weakness or as jars of clay. And so if you were to write jars of clay as the heading, you would write afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. And on the other side, you can write power of God. And under that heading, you could write, but not crushed, but not driven to despair, but not forsaken, but not destroyed. God's power shown through weakness. And Paul continues, verses 10 to 12. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death, for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And essentially, Paul's saying the same thing that he's already been saying in these three verses. He's making the same point. He's just doing it in a different way, in a a very Christ-centered way. The word for death would be better translated in these verses as dying. It's referring more to the process of dying as opposed to the, the, the final end for life on earth. And so Paul is then in the process of dying for Jesus' sake. In other words, he's experiencing All of the instances of suffering akin to the suffering Jesus experienced that he's listed in verses 8 to 9. And it's ongoing. It's regular. It's a daily thing. Why? Why is he experiencing this daily process of dying? Well, he gives us the answer. So that the life of Jesus, which is at work in him, might be made known. In other words, his suffering and his endurance in the midst of that suffering is meant to serve as a witness to the life and power and glory of Jesus. It's to bring him glory. It's to show his power. Again, this is the main point of these first six verses. The fact that the Christian, the the clay pot, does not succumb to and is not defeated by his trials and problems, but perseveres through them, That's evidence of the life of Jesus at work within that Christian. 
It puts on display the surpassing power of God to others. And so in our suffering then, we become a witness to others of the surpassing power and glory of God. We're a testimony. When we go through hardships and difficulties, those around us are watching. Okay, believers and unbelievers alike, they're watching. And so in our suffering, God has given us a profound opportunity to put his glory and power on display. Simply by persevering through the suffering. By not giving up. By continuing to pursue Christ through the suffering. By continuing to fulfill the calling that he's placed on our lives. And the ministry that he's given us, whatever that might be. People will see our perseverance and they'll say, how? How is it that a clay pot, that an earthenware vessel, how can they possibly withstand so much pressure? When the heat is turned up, how can they avoid cracking? How can they survive under such opposition and stress? And when they ask those questions, our answer, of course, is because of the power of Christ within us. And then all the glory goes to him. And so you can start to see why God has chosen and designed it in this way. For his power to be made known in weakness. Our perseverance in suffering is a witness to the surpassing power of God. Number two. Our perseverance in suffering is strengthened by the hope of the resurrection. Our perseverance in suffering is strengthened by the hope of the resurrection. Look with me at verse 13 again. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. We learn in this verse that Paul's suffering and the way God used it was not unique to Paul. But this is a pattern in scripture. This is how God has always chosen to work. And so Paul here quotes King David. And King David surely was a man that could have echoed Paul's words in verses 8 and 9. Because he was a man acquainted with suffering and sorrow out of which many of the Psalms came. And so Paul quotes Psalm 116 Verse 10, and when Paul quotes a psalm, essentially he's referencing that entire psalm. Well, Psalm 116 is a psalm that recounts a time where David nearly died. He had a near-death experience. He found himself in deep distress. And in the midst of his distress and desperation, he cries out to the Lord for deliverance. The Lord hears his prayer and delivers his soul. As a result, this increases David's faith And so he speaks about it. He praises the Lord. He pens Psalm 116. Paul's situation here is similar. Time and time again, Paul sees throughout his life, the Lord deliver him quite literally from death. And as a result, Paul's faith is strengthened as he's witnessed the Lord's power in that situation. And so he testifies to it. He speaks of it. He praises the Lord for it. But the verse in this passage In these few verses for this point that I want to focus on, more in depth is verse 14. Because in this verse, I believe Paul reveals a secret to how he's able to submit to such a difficult call and all of the trials that that calling on his life brings. Verse 14, he believes, so he also speaks, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. And so Paul's focus on, in the midst of his suffering, was not on his present circumstances, but rather his focus was on the future hope that he has in Jesus. His focus was not on the here and now, but on what's to come. So as Christians, we celebrated the resurrection of Christ last Sunday. On Easter Sunday, we celebrated that the grave is empty, that the Lord is risen, And one of the reasons that this is such a cause for celebration, and there are many, is because Christ's resurrection is only the beginning. Christ's resurrection, the Bible says, is the first fruits. But when he comes again, all those who belong to Christ will rise again to be with him. And so in that sense, his resurrection is only the beginning. And this future hope of resurrection, this changes everything for Paul. It's what gives him the strength to persevere in his ministry. 
It's what gives him something to live for, something to press on for, something to hope for in the midst of affliction. The hope of the resurrection is why he's willing to always carry in his body the death of Jesus. The hope of the resurrection is why he's able to submit to the trials and the hardships and persecutions that his ministry entails. It's Paul's focus on the future that fuels his perseverance in the present. Okay, it's Paul's focus on the future that fuels his perseverance in the present. So I want to ask you, how often do you, especially in times of suffering, how often do you think about the future resurrection? How often do you find yourself looking forward to that great and glorious day? A day when we will be given new and glorified bodies. We will see our Lord face to face. There will be no more death, disease, or sorrow, or sickness, or sin. And all of the trials and the struggles and the sufferings of life will be but a distant memory. See, sometimes in the midst of suffering, especially intense forms of suffering, it's so hard for us to see past our present circumstances, isn't it? Our trials and our problems, they consume our thoughts. It's all we think about. We get up in the morning and for a few moments we have peace and then boom, it hits us. And right there, it's at the forefront of our minds. We can't shake it. Our head hits the pillow at night and the problems and difficulties that we face begin to flood our minds and we have a hard time falling asleep. How do we persevere in such seasons of life? How do we press on? How do we not lose heart? Well, we have to learn to zoom out. We have to learn to zoom out. We have to stop focusing on the present and start focusing on the future. We have to discipline our minds to think far more about the resurrection hope that we have in Jesus than we do about the trials that we face, whatever our current circumstances may be. This is what enabled Paul's perseverance. And this list of trials that, that we already looked at in verses 8 to 9, this is one of, I believe, four different lists that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians. As I said, it's a letter where he reveals much about the sufferings that he's experienced. And so to just think about what some of his present circumstances may have been when he wrote this letter, I want to read for you another list of his found in chapter 11, starting at verse 22. Okay, Paul was a man who knew suffering very well. They were best friends. I believe he's speaking of the super apostles that I mentioned earlier that he was opposing in verse 22. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and perhaps this is the greatest one of all, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches." Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? Okay, that's Paul. Those are the sufferings of Paul. How could a man who's experienced this much pain and heartache and suffering, how could he avoid being completely consumed by those circumstances? Well, he zoomed out. And he disciplined his mind to focus on the future resurrection, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us into his presence. Knowing that gave him great strength and the strength he needed to persevere. His focus on the future fueled his perseverance in the present. Let's look at verse 15 again in chapter 4. 
For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. I think this relates somewhat to the last point. Paul knows that God's sovereign power is using his perseverance in suffering and persecution to bring the gospel message to proclaim the power of Christ to more and more people, which will result in more converts, which in turn will result in increased praise and thanksgiving and glory to God, which is what he says there. And so again, it's God's sovereign power over suffering, coupled with a hope of the future resurrection that enables Paul to press on in faith and press on in his ministry and the calling that he has. Our perseverance and suffering is strengthened by the hope of the resurrection. Finally, number three, our perseverance and suffering is motivated by the eternal weight of glory. It's motivated by the eternal weight of glory. Uh, Paul reaches a conclusion in the next verse, and then he gives even more reasons for that conclusion in the verses to follow. But he reaches a conclusion here in verse 16 when he says, So we do not lose heart. In light of all that he said and what he'll say in the rest of this passage, we do not lose heart. We do not give up. We do not let the challenges of life consume us. We don't turn our back on the Lord. We don't fall during times of persecution. We don't forsake our faith when the going gets tough. But we press on. We plod away. We persevere. We do not lose heart. Because in part we know that our perseverance is a witness to the surpassing power of God. And because we know with surety that one day Christ will come again and we will rise with him. But we also don't lose heart, as we will see, because there's more than just resurrected bodies to look forward to, as great as that is. There's an eternal glory that is awaiting us that is beyond all comparison, such that our current sufferings can be said to be light and momentary in comparison. But let's continue in verse 16. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Paul's giving us there a little bit of an anthropology lesson. Okay, he teaches us that we have an outer self, we have an inner self. What does he say about our outer self? It's wasting away. Wasting away. Takes us back to that metaphor that we're just a jar of clay. Okay, more weakness in the text. We're frail, we're fragile. Our bodies are breaking down. We're aging, and quite literally, as he says, we are wasting away. Recently, I've had a humbling experience that has reminded me of this all-too-true reality. And so two months ago, I fully tore my ACL ligament in my right knee. And up until then, I'd never experienced any serious injuries really in my life, never really even rolled my ankle. I didn't tear anything when I was 15 years old. I didn't tear anything when I was 25 years old, but at 35, when I tore it, I fully tore my ACL. And I wish I could stand up here and give you some epic, memorable story about how I was camping with my family in northern Ontario and I had to fend off a black bear that came and I successfully did that, but unfortunately I tore my ACL. That would, be, that would make it worth it. <laughs> But I don't. I don't have an impressive story at all. The story is that I simply went up for a layup in a basketball game. Okay? Something I had done thousands of times before. My defender didn't even foul me. I didn't really even land that abnormally. Maybe slightly, but not that abnormally. And yet, I landed, my knee buckled, my leg gave way, I fell to the ground, and next thing you know, I couldn't walk. And now, no sports for like a year to a year and a half, depending on when the surgery happens. And the worst of it all is I didn't even make the shot. <laughs> the guy clean blocked it, and I fall to the ground. He was like 15 years younger than me. I remember lying there, and I knew it was a bad injury because it just felt so weird. And I wondered, why? Why? Essentially, all I did was jump up and down. I can't even demonstrate that for you right now. That's how sad it is. Why did this happen? 
And the answer really all boils down to this very simple explanation, my outer self is wasting away. We all feel it to some extent, don't we? All of our bodies are aging every second of every day. If you take an 80-year-old person in this room and you put them next to a 20-year-old person, instantly you'll be able to see the difference, won't you? There'll be no fooling you. One has had 20 years of wasting away and the other has had 80 years of wasting away, four times the amount. There's a big difference. Well, through all of Paul's sufferings, through all of his hardships, through all of the daily carrying in his body the death of Jesus, Paul indeed has felt these effects. Every beating that he underwent, his body was a little weaker. It was a little harder to endure. Every hardship that he had to persevere through, maybe it was a shipwreck, was a little harder than the last as more of his strength had faded away. And for those in the world who have no future hope, who only look to that which is seen and not to that which is unseen, this reality that our outer selves are wasting away, this is a devastating reality. Because this, this is all they've got. And so they'll do whatever they can to fight off that aging process. Okay, they'll try new diets, they'll frequent the gym, they'll buy new cosmetic creams, they'll put on the makeup, they'll get the surgeries. Not that any of those things are necessarily wrong in and of themselves, but in the end, it's all a fool's errand. Maybe they'll buy themselves a few more years, maybe they'll put off the aging process by a few more months, but no matter what, their outer selves will waste away. But Paul does not lose heart over this reality. The Christian should be able to come to terms with aging and the increasing weakness that we experience in our lives, because while the outer man is wasting away, Paul says the inner man is being renewed day by day. And so there again, we see the power of God. In the outer man, we see our weakness. In the inner man, we see God's transforming power, molding us more into the image of Christ. And so our sufferings then are used not only to remind us of our frailty, but also to sanctify us. To renew that inner man. To transform us from one degree of glory to another, as he says elsewhere in the letter. Our physical bodies get weaker, but our inner selves get stronger. The decay of the earthly body happens simultaneously with the renewal of the inner person. And that second part, that counts for so much more, doesn't it? Because that's of eternal significance. These bodies, we'll be given new ones. We don't need these bodies when we leave this world. And so our souls, our inner selves are of eternal significance. I want you to notice that this verse is not a command to renew our inner self. Okay, we could turn other places for that. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? Make every effort to supplement your faith. We could turn to other verses for that. But this verse is a declaration, It's a declaration that our inner self, if we are in Jesus, is being renewed. That God is finishing the good work that he has begun in us. And so we ought to rejoice in this verse. Even as we're reminded of the frailty of our outer selves, we ought to rejoice that our inner selves, they are indeed being renewed. God is renovating us. John Calvin put it this way. He said, the decay is visible and the renovation is invisible. The decay is visible, the renovation is invisible. Finally, let's look at uh, verses 17 to 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Notice this comparison in verse 17. The comparison between our sufferings in this world and the glory that is to come. When we compare our sufferings in this world to the glory that is to come, our sufferings can be said to be light and momentary. Now some may wonder, Paul, how how can you say that? How can you be so insensitive to call my trials light and momentary? Don't you know how hard life can be for me at times? Don't you know how dark it can be? Trust me, Paul knows. He does. We already read through all that he's experienced. 
This whole letter is about his suffering. But his comments here in this verse, they're not a commentary so much on the insignificance of whatever your current trial right might be, as it is a commentary on the significance of the glory that is to come. And Paul here, if anyone was able to pen these words, it was Paul. Paul was given a taste of that glory. It's quite incredible. He reveals this later in the letter. In chapter 12, verses 2 and 4, Paul says this. Speaking in the third person of himself, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. And so Paul, Paul's caught a glimpse of that glory that is to come, a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of paradise. It was too great and glorious for him to even talk about, for him to utter. We also know at his conversion, he was privileged to see the glorified Jesus face to face on the road to Damascus. And so he's been given a small taste of glory. He's not seen all of it. He's not experienced all of it, just a small sliver of it. And in comparison, his trials are light and momentary because of how glorious and how satisfying and how great that sliver of glory was. He can see his earthly afflictions as light and momentary. Essentially, this verse is teaching us that it's all relative. It's all relative. If I, if I compared the size and the mass of one of the portables in the back parking lot, I were to take its size and its mass and I were to compare it to this church building, the size and mass of this church building, we might conclude that while both are large structures, much larger than ourselves, the church building is more significant than the portable. But if we took those two buildings that vary in significance when compared to one another, and we compared them and contrasted them with the size and mass of Mount Everest, well, they'd both be considered incredibly, incredibly small and light in comparison, wouldn't they? Our sufferings may not be light and momentary on their own, but when they're compared to the weight of glory that is to come, they are. Again, Calvin says helpfully on this, this comparison makes that light which previously seemed heavy and makes that brief and momentary which seemed to be of boundless duration. When we have once raised our minds heavenwards, a thousand years begin to look to us to be a moment. So again, it's all about having the right perspective. If we're focusing solely on our struggles and our issues and our problems, then they will appear to us to be massive and crushing. They will crush us underneath the weight. But if our focus is on the future glory that is to come, if that's what we live for, if that's what dictates how we, orient, how we live and order our lives, then they will seem light and momentary in comparison. In verse 18, Paul gives us one final pointer to how to keep our focus heavenward, as Calvin said. He says, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look around. Just look around at everything you can see. Everything that you see right now, temporal. Okay? Dust. It's transient. It will all be gone. It won't last. And there are no exceptions. If that's true, if that's true, then don't orient your lives around what you can see. That wouldn't make any sense. Instead, orient your lives around that which you cannot see. Don't orient your lives around things like money or stuff or health or fitness or a big house or a nice fancy car because those things won't last. In fact, many times suffering will come and what will it do? It will take those things away from us. And when that happens, if our primary focus is on those things and not on what truly matters then the weight of those trials will be unbearable because we're losing that which matters most to us. But if your focus is on that which is unseen, if your focus is on that which truly matters, 
then you will be able to persevere because that which is unseen is eternal. It cannot be taken away. It cannot be destroyed. No matter what suffering comes, you can't lose it. And so what unseen things ought we to orient our lives around? How about the triune God? The Bible says no one has ever seen God. The triune God, he's unseen. The ongoing renewal of the inner person, we can't see that, but we know it's happening. The complete restoration of his creation, it's still to come. The fulfillment of all of God's promises, the return of Christ, the sure and final victory over sin, death, and Satan. The future glory that awaits us. All of these things are unseen realities and we must seek to look to them. Focus our minds and our hearts on them. And if we do that, then we will be able to persevere in the trials of life. So Christian, sufferer, whatever you might be going through right now, whether it be sickness or disease or aging or loss or miscarriages or wayward children or financial need or marriage problems or family conflict or persecution or depression or disappointment or whatever it is, remember, as Christians, we do not lose heart. No matter how difficult those things may be, we do not lose heart. Why? Why? Because our perseverance in suffering is a witness to the surpassing power of God. And that's the purpose of our lives. It's to bring him glory. We are jars of clay. And when the suffering of, sufferings of life come and they cause us to crack a little bit, that allows for all the more light to shine through us as we are witness, a witness to others of the sovereign power of God. The one who will not let us be crushed or driven to despair or forsaken or destroyed. Our perseverance in trials is strengthened by the hope of the resurrection. And so allow yourselves to be shaped by your future. The day is coming when Christ will return and we will rise to be with him. So live today for that day, not for today. And finally, our perseverance and suffering is motivated by that eternal weight of glory. The trials of life, though exceedingly difficult at times, they are indeed but light and momentary when compared to all that God has in store for those he loves. And so we must then discipline ourselves and especially our minds to have an eternal perspective as we seek to look not to the things that are seen because it will all pass away, but to the things that are unseen because they are eternal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning and the encouragement and comfort that it brings to us. Pray that you would help us to apply its truth to our hearts. Pray for those who do find themselves in places of suffering here this morning, that you would comfort them, that somehow your power would be made known in their weakness that they would not lose heart, but they would persevere and continue to seek after the Savior, and that you would use them to bring much glory to yourself, even in the midst of their suffering. Help us all to focus our hearts and our minds on the future hope that we have in Jesus, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of glory. For those in our midst who do not yet know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, would they come to realize that they are but clay pots, desperately in need of a Savior, would they turn from their sin and trust in Christ? It's in his name we pray. Amen.